Thank you, Sarah, for this introduction. That's really great. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone in, in attendance today for joining us for this overview of software collection development. So software, uh, in its very nature, is a collection. It is a network of interdependencies and apparatus bringing together arrays of code, libraries, hardware, and other software relying on one another. Software is interesting to almost every single piece of technology we use in our everyday lives, computers, cell phones, printers, cars, microwaves. It is the brain and the neuronal system through which data inputs navigate inside these machines. In return, each piece of software influences the way in our brain works. It shapes our subjectivities, or as digital media scholar Matthew Fuller wrote in his 2003 book, Behind the Blip, it constructs ways of seeing, knowing, and doing in the world. Collecting is the first and foremost step to preserving and giving access to software artifacts and to digital objects in more general terms. But who is resp responsible sorry, for collecting, preserving, and giving access to software? Who's sharing this concern? Despite the correlative nature of software and dig digital archives preservation, very, very few repositories have the necessary resources to integrate software into their collections. A recent survey led by SPIN showed that 84% of respond respondents, mostly libraries and archives professionals, had no specific language in their policies concerning software, among which more than half had no, had no plans to review their policies in the next few years, and even less to include software collection in an upcoming revision. By using the expression software collecting and software collections development, we are here referring function of establishing policies and procedures for selecting and acquiring software materials that are grouped under unifying characteristics, whether they be subjects, formats, creators, time periods, and others. So before considering our contemporary era, I wanted to take a look back and the recent period of interest in software collections. In 1986 and 1987, David Bierman publishes recommended acquisition policies for a software archive on the account of the Computer History Museum, alongside, alongside with a study report titled Collecting Software, a New Challenge for Archives and Museums, which underlined the absence of consideration for historical software collections in archives. So if we compare the conclusions from Behrman's report with the outcomes of the 2017 SPIN metadata standard survey mentioned earlier, what can we conclude? 30 years later, what is the current situation in software libraries, archives, and repositories? How can we maintain and improve the way we collect software today? Software collection development may be better defined by its contextual settings and use cases. Characteristics, sorry, such as collecting policies, scope and content, and format can be looked over to identify possible collecting profiles. So in order to better understand the gaps and intersections between the variety of approaches in software collection development, I have put together here four different collecting profiles portrayed by a few specific attributes that we will examine in more details in a moment with our guest speakers. But keep in mind that these are theoretical profiles and are most likely to be found in hybrid forms in practice. So our first profile is called systematic collections. This profile designates collections for which software is acquired and preserved as a utility for digital preservation. For these organizations, the development of a software collection acts as a way to preserve and give access to digital contents that are part of the institutional institutions' records, libraries, and archives. Since no single institution can possibly collect all the software titles needed to render and access the digital objects in its collection, present and future, we might think of systematic software collections in terms of uh, thematic documentation strategy. In other words, architecture organizations can focus on collecting computer-aided design software such as FormZ, AutoCAD, and SoftImage, but also an office and productivity software, which are in use during the development of an architectural project. For software that is uh, used as a utility or for documentary purposes, we can presume that only executable 
code will be collected since the software is mainly preserved for its technical capabilities and visual qualities. Our second profile, historical software collections, host institutions such as the Computer History Museum, the Living Computer Museum and Labs, and the Media Archaeology Lab that collects software as a cultural and historical artifact in itself. Popularity, technical innovation, and visual qualities can be considered as valid assessment criteria for this collecting profile, in addition to cultural significance in the dynamic history of the personal computer. Historical software collections collect software in both executable binary files and source code, but also their physical packaging, manuals and printed documentation, promotional pamphlets, and other derivatives. They can also tend to collect compatible hardware, such as vintage computer, mouses, keyboards, in order to recreate the original setup and user experience of the software. Our third profile points out to the art institutions and galleries that collect software as an artwork either in itself or as a component of a large, larger software dependent artwork. From the dematerialization of the artwork in conceptual and performative arts to the integration of new digital and time-based media, the evolution of artwork changes the needs for preservation methods. To quote Richard Reinhardt, uh, in his contribution to the variable media approach, we need a layered preservation strategy that admits fragments and traces, emulation software, recreation and reassemblage that no longer consider the art object as a monolithic original artifact. Uh, so nowadays, software and dedicated hardware is saved when an art institution acquires a media art piece for further dissemination of the work. Then again, software can make its way into the collection in both executable and source code form, especially if it appears useful to prevent and resolve bugs uh, during the art piece installation. So our last profile is uh, software source code repositories. Some source code repositories, as you may know, can be highly curated and specific, while others are more generic and function without selection policies. Um, so we have listed here a multiple, multiplicity of types of uh, source code repositories um, that can be used either for ongoing development and providing access to the source code to software developers or in more long-term preservation for soft, of software search code. Um, so such institutions such as the Software Heritage, Internet Archive, and National Libraries and Archive uh, cover that mandate. So for those of you who are specifically interested in this last profile, um, just so you know, we will cover a more thorough analysis of its characteristic uh, in an upcoming interview with Roberto Di Cosmo, who is the Director of Software Heritage. So I'd like to invite you all to stay tuned for this upcoming interview that will be shared on the Software Preservation Network. But for today's discussion, we will take advantage of our panel to focus on the first three profiles in software collections within cultural heritage and memory institutions. All right, so without further wait, I'd like to introduce our three guest speakers who have generously accepted our invitation to join this discussion around software collection development. So our first guest is Paula Jabloner, Director of Digital Collections at the Computer History Museum. She leads the creation, implementation, and maintains collect collections-wide digital strategies and infrastructure. Pola continues to give an innovative partnership between the museum and Cisco Systems, having established a Cisco Corporate Archive in 2013. Prior to taking on the Cisco Archive role, Pola was director of collections of the CHM. Our second guest is Pola Falcao. She is a time-based media conservator at Tate, where um, she, well, her role is to um, include the conservation of new time-based media artworks coming to the Tate collection. She is uh, part of a team at Tate developing the processes necessary for preservation of digital artworks. During, during 2013 to 2014, she researched the use of virtualization for preservation of software-based artworks. And our last guest speaker for today is Tim Walsh. 
Tim is a digital archivist at the Canadian Centre for Architecture. He is responsible for developing and managing workflows and software for processing the CCA's born digital archives. Tim is also an active member of several collaborative efforts to address question, questions of preservation and access for digital design records, including the Society of American Archivists CADBIM Task Force and the Software Preservation Network. So now that, now that we have introduced our guest speakers, we'll dive into our discussion. So first, thank you again, Paula, Patricia, and Tim for joining uh, this discussion. So as a start for our discussion, I'd like to ask you a rather simple but very explicit question. How did you get your hands on the material, um, so basically software material in your collection? So if each of you could map out your acquisition process and your relationships with donors, loaners, sellers, and or manufacturers, uh, that would be a good start for a discussion. So maybe we could start um, with you, Paula. So if you could describe maybe the um, Computer History Museum's software acquisition policies and process and describe a little bit how you, you uh, acquired the material in the collection, that would be great. Okay, thanks Anne-Marie. So the museum has been collecting software since the 1980s, but it's been relatively haphazard back in that time. We were actually located in Boston at that time. So we did commission the Bierman report, but we didn't really follow through with on it. And then the whole collection, so when I say haphazard, I mean it's like we really concentrated on hardware. And if some software came along with it, we said groovy and we took it, but it wasn't like really proactive. Then the whole collection moved out to California in the mid to late 90s. And at that point, the museum became more focused on software, not just hardware. And they also started collecting a lot more archival documentation material as well. And and it's really, um, at that point, it was still reactive collection, recollecting. So we really just had a website and people put in um, tickets um, on, I mean, inquiries on the website and we take it or not take it. And then about um, two years ago, we started a center for software history. And so at that point, we became very, much more proactive. We still do the reactive collection, um, but at that point we really um, started to pound the pavement. We have two curators that go out and really target how we collect and thinking more broadly. Um, so I'm not sure I want to spend all the time talking about how we do that. Um, the third thing we do is we also collect limited amounts of source code and that's really driven by the chair of our board and he actually this is not open source source code he really actually spends lots of time trying to get agreements so that we can post the source code for users to look at and so we have actually got agreements to release Photoshop, Apple DOS 2, and other types of source code. Um, and then lastly, we do not buy, and we strongly discourage loans. Um, mm -hmm. of, you know, it's more we deal with loans to other museums for hardware. So we really try to discourage people to loan us source code or other types of code, but it gets very complex with um, legal issues. So not appropriate for right now right <laughs> well that's a first uh, that's a great first overview of your collection um maybe to continue of this on this idea of um, the format in which you collect uh software either it is source code or uh, executable files maybe i would jump into um patricia so we were discussing this um earlier this week um could you maybe Describe also what is your collecting process, what type of material you collect when you acquire 
new artworks uh, at the Tate and it, in which form it arrives? Uh, yeah, sure. So I guess the first point that I need to make is that we, we don't define what we do as collecting software. We define it as we're collecting artworks. And that process is defined by our, by our um, curators, which are looking at artworks and not necessarily at the technology that is used to produce them. So that is the, the focus is the artwork and not and the technology that produces is sort of it's part of it, but it's not the core. Uh, and that affects the way um, we see the preservation of, of the software and the artwork. Uh, what tends to happen is we receive computers from the artists with their software installed. Um, and there is a big moment of a very uh, important conversation that we have at that stage where we are, where we have agreed to receive the work into the collection, which is where we try to understand how relevant is that specific software for an artwork. Um, and how, how does it influence the meaning of, an, of the artwork and how important is that technology for the artist? And so in some cases, we don't have any specific one in the collection, but the, the, the code and the software is the artwork. But like you say before, in, but in some cases, the, the software is a, a means to achieving an end. And so the artist is quite happy to say, no, you don't need that piece of software. You can use something else. Um, and then there is this tension, uh, we were just talking about this earlier today, there's this tension between displaying an artwork and allowing the public to experience it, but also this very interesting production history that if you look at something like a painting, you can come back 20 years later and analyze it and see what the materials were, while with software, if you don't preserve the software as well, then you might lose an important part of that history. But on the other hand, you cannot be tied down to the software if that means that you then uh, can show the artwork. Um, and in terms of our acquisition process, we would usually, for a software-based artwork, we tend to work directly with the artists. Uh, they, we tend, uh, actually, an important point is our collection at the moment is 10 artworks, so it's a very small fraction of the overall Tate collection or even our time-based media collection, which includes video and film and slides. So uh, software is a tiny bit of the collection that takes a huge amount of our time in, 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 in comparison. Um, so we would want to define what, what the software is. We also have a very strong component of hardware. So some of our works are installations where you have, uh, one of the examples that will be on show in Montreal in a couple of weeks is, for instance, Subtitle Public by Rafael Lozano Hammer, where you have a system of cameras and a network of computers and projectors. And so we do need to have this connection between the hardware and all the peripherals. That means sometimes uh, some limitations in terms of what we can do for preservation as well. Um, but that is something we define at acquisition, but because they're all different artworks and all different uh, materials, uh, technologies, uh, these solutions need to be specified for each artwork. We have been developing some best practices re recently, so we would, at that point of acquisition, we would uh, create these images for the computers that the artist supplies, we would collect any executables, we would also try um, we would also want to have the source code if it's available and, and sensible. Um, and we would also consider purchasing other software that we may need to access um, the artwork. So for instance, we have some uh, flash animations and for that we, we actually got some, a director version to be able to analyze those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting, this question of what you're actually collecting uh, when you collect software or artworks. Um, and we'll go back to that uh, in the next question. But before jumping into this next, next question, uh, Tim, if you could uh, give us an overview of your situation at the CCA. So um, with the, um, Oliver, with the AIA software collection. So how did you get your, your hands on that? And do you have a clear 
um, acquisition process and policies right now? How is that going? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Um, we're also collecting software a few other ways, so I think I'll try to give a sort of higher level um, uh, understanding of that as well. Um, so one of the ways that we're collecting software at the CCA is through partnerships. Um, that is certainly what the AIA project qualifies as. Um, so essentially going around to the community of other people dealing with design records um, and um, finding who has software collections but doesn't necessarily have the capability to sort of disk image and preserve them um, and working in tandem um, so that we can, as a community, start building software collections um, that are useful across our institutions. Um, that is definitely a new thing for us. It raised all sorts of interesting questions. Um, Anne-Marie and I had lots of conversations with our copyright officer um, about um, where our stance was in terms of fair dealing and software, uh, which I know we're going to explore in a future webinar, so I'll leave that there for now. Um, but that's one avenue that's been very productive. Um, the AIA Oliver Witt Software Collection um, is comprised of software that was sent to the AIA for review in the 1980s and 1990s, um, and then kept in a closet. Um, the nice thing is it in, comes in um, its original packaging with original manuals, hardware keys when they're there, <clears throat> which is really um, pretty wonderful for a collection like that. Um, we're also collecting software through two other avenues. Um, so one is from donors. Um, so in our library collection, for instance, um, C ROMs often come with their own software dependencies, uh, particularly for um, projects from sort of the early days of the web where people wanted to do browser-based projects but streaming video wasn't really an option. Um, burning it to a CD with, with the kind of software dependencies um, was not uncommon. Um, in the archives, donors often um, are giving us media from a closet <laughs> for projects from the 80s and 90s. Um, so, you know, whether it's a, a PC or a stack of floppy disks, CDs, that sort of thing. Um, and those sometimes include software as well. Um, that can sometimes bring a challenge too. Um, you know, that we either have to wrap that software into the deed of gift or figure out our policy on um, when we will integrate that into our software collection and when we will not. Um, and in at least one case, um, a donor of a rather large archive um, also donated um, the hardware necessary to run the files. Um, so in this case, um, the CC has collected a couple projects from firms that were working on silicon graphics machines in the 90s, um, essentially borrowing tools from Hollywood and, and the CGI industry um, in order to do real-time virtualiz visualization, virtualization, um, 3D modeling. Um, so one donor in particular gave us two silicon graphics in indigo machines um, with all the peripherals and software, which is really fantastic because um, as far as I know, there's not um, an emulator for that environment um, yet. Um, and then finally, um, and something I think is worth talking about a bit, um, we've also been collecting software directly from the software vendors. Um, so over the last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time on the phone with sales offices, development offices, um, executives who maybe have been at companies for quite a while um, and are concerned about their legacy, um, explaining our use case um, that we use their software not to design um, and not to make a profit, but in order to facilitate research into the history of design and digital design. Um, and in many cases, we've received quite a lot of donated software um, in return. This is typically contemporary software. Um, so, you know, maybe the Autodesk 2014 suite um, or, um, you know, the new version of ArchiCAD, that sort of thing. But in a couple of cases, um, some vendors really understood what we were going for and donated older software as well. Um, so uh, Bentley Systems, for instance, um, as soon as I found the right person, which did take, you know, you know, talking to someone on LinkedIn and then another person on LinkedIn and then calling someone and then they put you in touch with someone. But once they found the right person um, who was sympathetic and able to help, um, they donated not only um, a Windows XP era version of their software, but also um, the licensing server necessary to run it, um, all of which could be kind of packaged and run in an emulator. Um, so I think there are times when it makes sense to go directly to the vendors, times when it makes sense to collect elsewhere, but um, in my experience, that's actually been a pretty successful approach as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, this relationship with vendors can definitely be very complicated at times, and there is a bit of um, uncertainty and um, a need for resources and common 
practices in this field. And I'm sure um, in the next few episodes, we'll cover that in more details. Um, I'd like to switch to our next question, though, regarding um, why the reason between your, your software collections and uh, your motivations also, and if you also think about uh, different use cases when uh, you, you collect software. So if, I don't know if your software collection is already accessible to the public, and um, if it is, I'd like to know if researchers using them have, in, have had like an impact on the, your policies in any way or on your acquisition um, practice. So two things here. Why are you collecting and for, for who are you collecting software? Paula, maybe if you want to, want to jump on this one. Okay. So um, we collect software as part of a comprehensive view of computing history. Um, we feel our diversity in collecting allows us to tell more comprehensive stories and provide a wealth of materials for researchers, including internally, to truly understand and, resor and research the software explosion, but more broadly, really, the um, revolution in computing and information technology. Um, and that's why our mandate is not just software. Like I said, we collect all kinds of hardware, including large mainframe computers, um, um, archival materials. We actually have almost a thousand oral histories recorded now as well, with a certain amount of them from, of course, programmers and people in the software industry. We collect all kinds of historic audiovisual materials, and then, of course, the software. And so, um, if you want to talk about proactive collecting, now that we have the Center for Software History, we've done a lot of work around the Xerox Alto computer because we want to collect that. So if you don't know, the Alto is from the mid-1970s, and it was developed out here by Xerox Lab. And I'm not going to go into detail, but most of the features you see, you use on your current computer came out of the Xerox Alto back in the 70s. Um, so we use a lot of this content internally. So we have a lecture series and the curators write things up. So the Alto really was a, a major push for us um, to document the birth of the modern PC in some ways, or at least the software of the modern PC. And we're, we're even actually talking now about doing a very small sort of documentary film on it. We've gotten original programmers to come in and we filmed them working on a restored Alto. Uh, actually an original Alto from the 70s that we've restored and it's quite a complicated process. But to use some of that footage talking about why they chose, so cut and paste comes from the Alto essentially, you know, how did they design for that? Why did they design for that? Um, and so, and then we really just are trying to get, unlike, let's say, computer, you know, artworks, we just want a comprehensive collection of software in all its forms. We actually, our earliest software is from 1953. <laughs> Um, but we feel it's important that we collect some of the earliest software, and that's actually paper tape from mm -hmm. MIT's WorldWind computer. We actually are contemplating a project internally to try to read. Well, it's easy to read the tape. It's unclear how you figure out what is actually on the tape once you've read it. At least we have a software curator that can read it. I, of course, have no idea what he really does. <laughs> and so I think currently our heaviest users are ourselves 
we have about, we think about 50,000 software titles, about 9,000 of them are on our, um, are actually on our um, collections catalog online. And we're really working with the center to encourage more research, research into that collection. Mm -hmm. And over the last year or two, we have gotten much more interest from others, certainly media studies people have started looking at the collection. We have actually some legal prior art research into the collection. Um, and we've certainly loaned, we actually have like provided access to some of the software to others based on whether we feel we can under fair use guidelines. So our expectation is we'll get a lot more users in the future, but it's it's just growing right now right it's underway let's say yes. you, you are the main users but also more and more you see interest coming from the outside world <laughs> mm -hmm. yes every year i've been here it's grown that's fascinating well thank you paula um i'd like to switch now to patricia if you'd like to talk a little bit about um users of uh the software that you collect i i can imagine that mainly that designates uh, viewers into the gallery, but maybe you can uh, give us a little bit more information about that. Uh, yeah, so definitely the, the first, um, we are, the first, the main priority is to preserve the artworks, to be able to present them in the gallery to the visitors. Um, and that is really what the, the, the what we want to achieve. But the other side of that is that we also produce really um, thorough documentation of all these works. And so that, that doesn't happen a lot yet. We've had uh, just, at the moment we have one PhD student that is looking at our documentation for his thesis. But I see that as something that we, as, as curators and particularly art curators, of course, start to be interested in the history of these works. Uh, that will also be a part of it and we are sort of documenting these works with that in mind as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, in relation to that, uh, Tim, maybe you could uh, also talk about the use cases at the CCA uh, since the project is currently under development, so it's in, in processing phase. Um, what can you uh, project are you trying to project what potential users would could want from their collection? How are you um, integrating that into the way you process the material? Right. Um, for the AIA software collection, I mean, it's largely, um, like you said, Anne-Marie towards the beginning, it's largely um, seen as sort of a utility for us. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting scholarship that could happen on this software that was, um, you know, not the market winners um, that looked at alternate ways of designing, alternate types of interfaces, um, that sort of thing. Um, but primarily, we're collecting this material because we collect computer aided design, 3D modeling um, files, which are highly software dependent um, and um, sort of notoriously tricky from a preservation and access perspective. Um, and the easiest way, or perhaps in some ways the best way, at least in some cases, um, to facilitate um, access to this material is to serve it up in its original software or you know, similar software that can, that can render the files accurately. Um, and so I imagine that for the most part, the use case um, for the near future at least will be um, using this software to set up um, environments in emulators or virtual machines. Um, where our researchers um, can come and interact with collection material um, in a sort of lockdown reading room workstation sort of environment. Um, in many ways, we're um, sort of bound to that sort of um, arrangement for the moment due to our uh, donor agreements. Um, we found that um, donating digital files, especially high fidelity 3D models and building information models, which are almost essentially a virtual representation of a building, um, is not a thing that architects are used to doing yet. And so there was a lot of trepidation. Um, and so um, you know, ensuring that access happened locally 
um, and under similar circumstances to how we provide access to our physical collection um, went a long way to um, soothe people and uh, make them feel better about donating their material. Um, I think in other ways though, um, the CCA is, is somewhere in between the Computer History Museum and the Tate in that um, much of our anticipated use is going to be outside researchers, um, but we also are a publishing house um, and a museum um, that develops our own shows um, and that sometimes travel. Um, so I can imagine that the software will also be useful for our own curators to be able to engage with material over time um, and um, you know, be able to really get to the content that, that, that they want to to fulfill their, their research questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that's a really great answer, Tim. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to maybe open up the discussion to the public just because we're um, 15 minutes before the end of this webinar episode. So um, if you have any questions, please, you can post them in the chat box. Uh, so we'll go through them as they arrive. But until then, until we have our first questions, maybe um, if we could. Um, address this question of the differentiation between collecting and ensuring software preservation. So I'd like to know, Paula, for example, I know that you were talking to me about, well, first this um, project in preserving uh, the Alto computer. Um, could you maybe differ differentiate your activities in terms of collecting and preserving? And if you feel like both are interconnected or if there are different activities within your institution? So I feel both that they're connected and different inter, um, different. I mean, we work very closely sort of the digital group with the software curators and some things we, when we take them in, we really need to figure out, is there a way to preserve it? Some things we take in and we know we're taking in just as a physical object. We don't assume it's actually software. So one thing we have is original tapes from the UNIVAC computer circa 1950. Um, which was really the first commercial computer, but we don't expect to ever be able to read those metal, it's actually metal tapes. It's, it's, um, and so that we're taking in just as an object for display. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, and they're sort of cool. They're red and they say UNIVAC on the side, but it looks like magnetic tape, but it's actually metal tape. Um, and then the other thing is when we talk about collecting software, so again, going back to the Alto project, we can't actually, the only way to preserve the Alto software is to read the disk pack. So um, they're large, essentially platters encased in plastic. And like, so the PC era software, we can get different, there's methods of disk imaging, but the only way we can read them for preservation purposes was to actually, we, one of the reasons we restored the computer so that Al, the software curator, could actually read those and then connect it to a modern computer via mm -hmm. the restoration and that's how we got the bis bits off the disk pack. So it's sort of a very complicated question depending on um, what is our objective when we collect something. Right. So, and Paula, I'm, I'm going to jump into uh, this uh, case that you're describing here because we have a question that relates to... Okay relates to that uh, in the chat box. So this question is from Courtney. Um, she says, uh, I'm interested to know if there is a particular software artifact that has presented the biggest challenge for each of our panelists. So I guess that's one of the um, software artifact that you've had um, maybe <laughs> a big <laughs> challenge uh, rescuing. Uh, maybe Patricia and Tim, if you, could, if you could talk about something you can think about in terms of um, preservation challenge. Uh, shall I start? Um, so I would have to say that 
well, I am currently working with actually with Tom Ensign, who is also on on the on the call today, uh, on this artwork subtitled "Public by Lozano Hammer," and the, the software itself has run fairly well, a lot better than we expected because it was uh, created for Windows XP, and we could run it on Windows 10 without any problems. Uh, the, what was difficult is because it needs to be set up within a space and it needs to work with uh, this ecosystem of cameras and projectors and the network and to, and there's a series of settings that you have to get right to so that the software runs correctly mm -hmm. and that has taken us a lot longer than i thought we would need um so that was is currently the most challenging thing i can imagine well not that i can imagine but that we've worked on really Right. And uh, Tim, what about you? Do you have a, a case in mind, a challenging uh, software? Yeah, I think um, in, in some ways, um, most computer aided design and, and BIM building information modeling software is quite challenging um, in that it's a, it's a highly competitive market. Um, in many ways, this software is kind of sold like used cars. Like there's no posted price, but it's gonna cost you a lot and you're gonna to have to negotiate with someone. Um, and the vendors rely on a model of forcing everyone to upgrade every six months or a year, which is why there's not much market incentive for them to provide good backwards compatibility with older file format versions. Um, but that's resulted in a number of other phenomena too that make preservation difficult. Um, so one of those is that, um, Many of these software platforms um, will only run even with a valid license or serial number if there's a hardware key also plugged into the computer, um, which most of these most of the time these days is a USB thumbstick that has to be plugged into the PC tower, um, but you know has come in other forms like parallel port uh, uh, sticks, that sort of thing. Um, that can pr prove to be a real challenge when you want to go then run that um, software in an emulator where there is no physical machine to plug those dongles into. Mm -hmm. um, it opens up all sorts of questions about DRM and whatever. Um, Jason, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it gets to William's question a little bit too, um, which is that, you know, yeah, there is a difference between sort of boutique artworks and these big commercial platforms. Um, so one way of protecting their profit motive, or their profit interest, um, now is that all of the CAD software vendors are basically moving to cloud subscription-based services, which is gonna make preservation a really big challenge moving forward. Um, and I'm sure I'm like so glad to see momentum through webinar series like these, because I think that's how we're gonna be able to tackle these things. It's just, you know, big communities of engaged professionals working on it and caring about it. Um, but yeah, it's not getting any easier. In fact, it's getting quite a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to jump in the last thing you said, Tim, uh, regarding uh, this move in, movement from uh, physical media to, for example, using the cloud for distributing, distributing software. Uh, we have a question from William in the chat box who um, mentions that in the opening slide, there was a lot of uh, images of software disks. Uh, he wonders, how the move on online delivery will change the collecting policy and practices uh, and concludes by saying, I imagine uh, differences between large commercial systems like CAD and BIM versus boutique, um, boutique artwork, sorry. So what do you think about this? How do you think that can have an impact on uh, collecting policies and practices? Uh, just to say that the idea of boutique uh, artwork, so software artwork, there's some of those, but there's artists that are using any sort of software. So, um, yeah, we, we do have one work that uses Quest 3D or so or in game, game engine. So the idea of boutique is true maybe up until, or, well, it depends a lot on the artist. So. We are quite worried with the idea, with the, with um, software that, um, and we don't know exactly what we can do for for software where you have. Um, I'm sorry, I'm missing the word. Um, From software where you have, for example, subscriptions. Yeah, and, exactly. Okay. Sorry, that's the word I wanted. No, that's perfectly fine. That's 
uh, I can totally see the challenge uh, coming from that. And um, Paula, Tim, how would you react to that? Do you have, do you feel comfortable kind of uh, addressing this question of um, subscription licenses and uh, using the cloud for distributing software in your collecting policy, or is that kind of a gray area right now? So for the museum, it's completely a gray area right now. We've really been focusing more of the roots of software development, and we have not addressed that issue, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for us, um, well, we really build up a digital preservation program and now starting to build up a software preservation program through consciously trying to collect things from the 80s and 90s before they disappeared. Um, so our effort has been largely backwards facing up to this point. Um, I think one thing that we can do is to head off some of the problem by trying to encourage people to use open interoperable file formats and other standards moving forward. Um, but clearly that's not going to be enough. Um, and you know, creative types like designers are always going to resist that because if they want to do cutting edge parametric stuff or something, you know, that's not really going to work. Um, so I'm not really sure um, how we're going to go forward. Um, but I think one thing that we can do that will make a big difference is um, making it clear that we do have a business case to the software vendors, um, you know, and that we can all sort of work together on this. Um, it's something that people are often very cynical about, especially in the CAD space, but my experience talking to uh, people at the software companies is especially if you can find the right person who's been around for a while, who cares about the legacy, who understands the sort of historical trend, um, that they often are willing to work with us. Um, you know, and then on the other hand, we just have to continue to build sort of community resources and um, do this together rather than alone. Because I know the CCA will never have the funding or the influence to solve this problem, but uh, a distributed community of software pre preservation practitioners might. Yeah, that's a really great uh, closing note, in fact, Tim. I think I would like to uh, wrap up on this. So I know that we have a few questions left in the chat box, but unfortunately, uh, we're going to um, lack some time. So I'll have to to conclude for today. So I'd like to thank you, um, Patricia, Paula, and Tim for uh, participating in this discussion. It was really resourceful. And also I'd like to give a very warm thanks to Jessica, Elizabeth, and Andy from the Software Preservation Network and to Sarah and Paul from the DPC for being so supportive through the elaboration of this event uh, in software preservation. So I don't know if either Sarah or Jessica, you would like to uh, wrap up this episode and maybe give a few words for the next one. Yeah, um, sure. Thank you so much, Jean Marie, and thank, thank you, you so much, time. Patricia and Paula and Tim. Wow, that was that was awesome. Um, huge round of applause to our guests and our research lead and facilitator. Um, so again, thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. This episode will be posted on both the DPC and the SPIN websites, alongside supplementary resources, which have been contributed by Paula, Tim, Patricia, and Anne-Marie um, about this topic, software collection development. Um, and uh, next week, same time, episode three, we're gonna be looking at software reuse cases. Uh, that will feature your research and content lead, Andy Altenbach from Studio Gang, with special guest Matthew Allen of University of Toronto and Harvard Graduate School of Design, as well as Eric Kaltman of Carnegie Mellon University. And again, the recording as well as supplementary resources will be posted by Friday. We'll tweet those out and uh, we'll also send out an email blast with the link. I just want to continue to pose that after the series is over, we will distribute a follow-up survey to everyone that attended any episodes in the series. So please do keep track of topics that you'd like to hear more about as we cycle through all the episodes in the series. Um, and thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time.